We've got another sequence of questions coming up. This is the third sequence of questions that we've had. The first one was at the beginning of the Lankavatara Sutra, well, chapter 2, when Mahamati reeled off a list of questions to the Buddha. And there was supposed to be 108 in number. And they were a very mixed bag, most of them quite trivial everyday questions concerned with everyday knowledge. And just recently we had another sequence of questions which were more rhetorical questions. And these questions were concerned with putting spiritual teachings into perspective. They were rhetorical from the point of view of enlightenment practice from the point of view of successful enlightenment practice. And these questions coming up now have a slightly different tone as well. In a way they're more in indicative of enlightenment practice. Enlightenment practice is about realization. It's about realizing what we could refer to as the ground of our being. It's about realizing the miraculous nature of our transpersonal essence. That's one way of putting it, I guess. And we begin with enlightenment practice. Spiritual practice begins with enlightenment. It begins with remembering this essence, this ground. Because what happens is we keep forgetting. This is the nature of consciousness. It awakens, it sleeps, it awakens. Our normal condition though is one of imbalance. We spend most of the time in a rather comatose, automatic dream state. And as Enlightenment practitioners, we keep endeavouring to wake up. We not only keep endeavouring to wake up, we actually do keep waking up. But there are huge forces which want to bring us into a state of torpor once again. So I'm going to suggest that this is actually what these questions are about. They're about this coming and going. Let's take a look and see if this bears up. Verse 474 What is the Alaya? And whence the Manovinyana? How does the visible world rise? How does it cease from being visible? So what is the Alaya? Well the Alaya could be understood as what I've just been describing as the goal of enlightenment practice. Sometimes the word chitta is used, sometimes they're used slightly separately, sometimes they're used as synonyms. The point about alaya though is it contains this potential for forgetting itself. Alaya is the pure consciousness, it's pure awareness, but it has this potential for forgetting itself. This is the nature of consciousness, as I said. It's the very nature of consciousness to come and go. This is our experience, isn't it? There is an idea that enlightenment is a once and for all experience. Once you're awake, that's it. But it's been a thread of these videos to point out well, this isn't actually so, even in the case of the Buddha. The point is about enlightenment is it can always be returned to. This is the point. It's not somewhere that you arrive and stay there. But you can come and go to it with greater and greater frequency. But you're, ne you're never stuck. You're never abiding permanently in the house of enlightenment. But the house of enlightenment is always there. So this is the Alaya. And whence the man of Vijnana? 
Now the Manor Vineyard, I, I kind of think that maybe Manas is meant here. Manas is the mind. Mano Vignana is consciousness of thoughts, consciousness of ideas. And this is really what we get caught up in. We get caught up in ideas. We're not getting caught up in what is. We're getting caught up in what we think is. We're getting caught up in our ideas about the world. So this is the direction of our attention. It's the, it's the direction of our thoughts and ideas. And this is what leads us into sleep. The man of Vijnana here is possibly like the hypnagogic state. Most people aren't aware of this hypnagogic state. But if you've done some, if you've made some effort to remember your dreams or to practice lucid dreaming, one of the techniques is to try and stay conscious as you fall asleep. And when you do this, it's a very difficult thing to do unless you've got a natural talent for it. But when you do this, you'll become aware of a stream of images. This stream of images is just going on all the time. And at some point, your mind latches onto one of these images and gets taken into sleep by it. It's a very difficult one to uh, get through. I've had, I think I've only managed it once. It's an interesting practice, so it's quite intriguing, but it's very uncomfortable and takes quite a degree of commitment. But this is what's going on. There's all these images coming and going all the time, and consciousness just wants to enter into one of them. Once you enter into one of them, you're in a dream. So this is like the man of Vignana. The man of Vijnana is bringing up this constant stream of ideas, of understanding even, which consciousness enters into, and that becomes our everyday reality. How does the visible world rise? Well, along with man of Vijnana, consciousness of thoughts, consciousness of ideas, is consciousness of what we call sensory perceptions, consciousness of sights, of sounds and so on, of feelings, smells, tastes. And this we regard as representing a physical external world. That's what's meant by the visible world here. It's not just the world that we see, it's the world that we apparently live in. There are these sensations going on, which we ascribe to the various senses, and then we assume that these, what the senses are conveying is evidence of an external world. We have exactly the same experience in dreams. So this is how the visible world arises. It's to do with the power of consciousness. Consciousness believes in the reality of whatever it is experiencing. Afterwards, we might review that reality and take away the reality status of what we were, of what consciousness was experiencing. For example, dreams, hypnotic state, hallucinations, mirage, whatever. But at the time, that's reality. It's the same with realization. Part of realization is the realization that none of what we take as conventional reality of a visible external world, we realize that it has no intrinsic reality. <coughs> this is consciousness doing its thing again. And how does it cease from being visible? Well, we practice, we practice enlightenment. It doesn't cease from being visible in the sense that it just disappears and you're enveloped in some heavenly bliss cloud. No, you're just not taken in by it anymore. It's like a mirage disappears once you realize it's a mirage. 
or a hallucination or a hallucination it's still there it's just that its power is lost its power to suck you into its apparent reality has gone so that's what ceases not the actual mirage the mirage doesn't cease it's still there you're just not taken in by it anymore and it's the same when you're practicing enlightenment when you're stepping back from your beliefs, your thoughts and your moods when you step back from all this then you're no longer taken in by the visible world you come back to a sense of being to what the Buddhists call suchness